So we've got a bit of a change in focus now and I'm going to look at a small section of uh, suicide in Northern Ireland. Um, this is a topic that I've been thinking about for a long time, so 20 minutes is a bit of a tough ask. Um, but what I'm going to do uh, in this presentation is I'm going to introduce you to the topic of gender and suicide, very much from my own personal perspective. Then I'm going to talk you through the analysis that we have of 78 female suicides. And then I'm going to talk about where I think we go from here, because this is really only a starting point. So I now live in uh, Milton Keynes, which for those of you who don't know, is really like a really large Craig Avon in England. Um, but between 2010 and 2013, I worked on the project that was called the Understanding Suicide Project here. And during that time, I went to um, anything that was relevant, really, in the field of suicide. And these are some of the reports that I saw. This is the Samaritans. Um, this is the Meaningful Care Report, which is about suicide attempts. And finally, we have the Young Men in Suicide Project. And um, really, I got interested in the whole area of suicide. But this is where it became a little bit troublesome for me. Because what's the common, most common thing we know about suicide among the genders is that um, this is a Facebook ad that came to me just before Christmas. I don't know if you can see, but it says, men are three times more likely than women to die by suicide, and it then tells you to donate. This is from the Irish um, Sun newspaper, uh, and it says Irish men are four times more likely to die by suicide. Another from the Samaritan saying three, it's actually reaching out, trying to get men to seek help, and it's saying, you know, men are three times more likely to die by suicide. Talk to us. And this is a really typical visual representation um, of what you see a lot of times. And we've got this one woman here, and we've got these four men. And so you get this idea, really, over and over again. Um, and I do, I'm a feminist, so this is my perspective that it's just not happening among women. But what, what about this one woman? You know, she's still dying. I know there are four men, but you know, for me, it just became kind of interesting. So when I started to look at the literature about why women died by suicide, having thought about the public discourse and about how it's not a problem, I came to an interesting personal kind of conclusion. And I thought about um, a book that I admit I only half read when I was studying. Um, it was by Simone de Beauvoir. It's uh, The Second Sex. If you're not familiar with it, I'm not either, but I have read the first couple of chapters. I know the idea. It's about the fact that um, women are the second sex. We're always compared to men. Um, we're the other. Um, the, ma the man is the more dominant thing. And that's the kind of thing we see all the time in suicide research. But I also knew from having worked in suicide research for about 10 years by this point, that the second quote, which is from the beginning of her book, which is about how she hesitated to write a book on women because the subject is irritating and especially to women it's not new. And I felt like this about women in suicide because what we do know, what's said all the time, is that women attempt suicide more than men and they're likely to seek help. So there's this sense of, well, what can we do about them? You know, they're, they're slightly, um, and you know, we come across this all the time in the GP records, they're histrionic, you know, they're always seeking help and there's nothing really we can do to help them. So I was reluctant to look at it. But when I did, um, you find that they're lost. They're, they're just not there. Um, they're rarely discussed in isolation from men, even though we're repeatedly saying suicide behavior is gendered, it's different. But we know, we know what happens to men, but with women, we're not so sure. And you get, and it's, you know, and it's unfortunate, and if they were here, I probably wouldn't pull them out for examples, but you get this sense of they're less successful, they're less violent methods. You get the sense of less. Um, and what you don't often hear is that it's still the leading cause of death among women under 35. It's still there. And that's not just Northern Ireland as well. So this is a chart from um, Mike Tomlinson, who presented here first a few years ago, Kez. The bottom line is women. Uh, the top line is men. And yes, there's, the rate is smaller. But as you can see, it's still going up. It's not going up maybe in the dramatic way that the blue line is. Um, but it's still going up. And actually, what Tomlinson said at the time, and I didn't even notice when I heard his presenting until I actually started to think about it, he says that in his um, paper, the female suicide rate rose by 108% between 1999 and 2012. This was slightly higher than the male suicide rate rise. So all that time I was living here and hearing all about male suicide, and the rate 
was going up here with women, and I never heard anything about them. So here's where we get to our research. Um, the methodology's been reported elsewhere. We did it um, between 2010 and 2013. It was looking at deaths between 2007 and 2009. Um, what you need to know is that we went to coroner's office. Um, we found 78 women who had died by suicide during those two years. We then went to the GP records and looked at them. And we also asked relatives to talk to us. Um, and in that case, we got 15 qualitative interviews. It says in the introduction there were 16, but there was a slight problem with one of the interviews. So... We were looking at levels of help seeking in that study, and um, it's worth pointing out that, yes, they were seeking help. Um, if we look at the top, in terms of mental health problems, 69% of them at some point had listed in their GP records a mental health problem. 90% um, of them um, had attended the GP in the 12 months prior to their death. 83% of them had done so for something that was related to emotional or mental health. And in 43% of cases, they were under psychiatric care, active psychiatric care at the time of their death. Nine women were being managed by their GP. There were a few waiting assessment and a few had refused treatment. So these were highly engaged women. And the reason I point that out again is because we hear a lot about men not seeking help. And these women were seeking help. And for some reason, it didn't work. And we don't, we don't hear so much about that. There were some suicides outside of services. And there was an age differential here. We only had 10 women who'd never sought help, and they were younger. Um, so their average age was 17.5, as opposed to, I think it was 39 for the whole overall cohort. It's hard to speculate here on why, and there was some confusing messages coming from the qualitative interviews. Um, and we have a quote here from a father who was talking about his daughter. And he said that after um, her death, they'd gone through some stuff, and she had an appointment with the school counsellor. Um, it was a few days after she actually died. And um, at that stage, he thought she didn't know where else to go. She wouldn't have gone to the GP. And she didn't understand her feelings. And this is one of the confusing things about these young deaths, is that they're described as impulsive. And Thomas Joyner said that he doesn't really think impulsive suicides um, occur. And we're getting quite a confused mixed message from some of the younger, in that she, this young girl kind of booked the appointment, but for some reason didn't go. So it's not truly impulsive. And it implies there is a chance there to intervene, but for some reason she didn't go. And that might be due to a continued kind of lack of emotional literacy at that age. So just returning again to the whole cohort, um, I am a sociologist. So um, again, you can look at these, and think, these women and think they were mentally unwell. You can also look at the social issues they were dealing with. And this, that's what we did. We used a method called the sociological autopsy method. Um, and these were the issues that came up. Their bereavement, we've talked about this last year in Kez. It's already come up in Siobhan's talk. It's, a, it's an issue in Northern Ireland that's not really being appropriately responded to. Um, we also had issues around motherhood. That was in terms of um, postnatal depression, failed fertility, loss of custody, relationship breakdown, that kind of thing. There was also um, high levels of sexual assault among this group. And that was across the lifespan. So we had child abuse in there and adult um, rape. The reason the last one is important is that this issue was almost entirely hidden in the GP records. And what I mean is that if you looked for it in the GP records, you could find it. But you certainly didn't find it very easily in the coroner's records. Um, and I also wonder if issues of domestic abuse were, were, were hidden in some way in this group. Um, this is a quote from a husband who's talking about his wife, who had been attending psychiatric services. Um, and she had been sexually abused as a child. And I want to talk again about the, the complexity that the alleged abuser had actually just died, and this had brought up the issue for this is when it had first come up for her. Um, but her family didn't believe her, and she attempted suicides on six or seven occasions before she actually died. And again, I want to just stress the complexity and the need to look beyond labels. Um, this is a quote from a husband whose wife had been diagnosed as severely depressed. But he talks about this big combination of events at that time and how she was being bullied at work. Her father had died. They'd been burgled. She'd lost her wedding ring. And she's going through the change of life. And it's really, I just wanted to stress that although you can label these women as, as a particular diagnosis, which of these factors actually influence and which could you actually kind of intervene with? 
And the other reason this is important is because this came up a time and time again in terms of dissatisfaction with the services that people were being provided. So if you think about that 43% of these women were under psychiatric care at the time of their death, these are the kind of things that people were saying was wrong with the services they were being provided with. And we have husband number one here who's talking about the psychiatrist and how we'll give you this medication, another drug, and another one. She was on about four or five different, medi different medications. I'm not educated, but I thought you could talk to people more. Every time we went to see the psychiatrist, we had 15 minutes, and that's all you got. Another husband said, there was no therapy. It was an appointment every six months. It was pitiful. The hard work I had to do to get her GP to go and see the psychiatrist. So this, in some cases, had led to women not to re-engage. If they'd had a previous bad experience, they didn't re-engage. And this is a quote from a sister who's saying that she knew her sister was suicidal, and she talked to her about going to the GP, but she'd previously visited her back in, um, and I've removed the name of the two psychiatric institutions. She says, they're not nice places. It's driven by medical intervention. They put you on tablets. So I know it's been said time and time again, and it's, but I really just wanted to stress that families are saying this. Because of the nature of the issues these women are dealing with, it seems to them that they're not getting anything that's appropriately dealing with it. So in summary, we have this notion that gender is, a, is influenced by, it influences rather suicidal behavior, but we tend to only look at male suicide. The majority of the women here sought help, though the young people were less likely to do so. If you look at multiple data sources and quality, qualitatively driven analysis, you can draw out social issues. So you can find a medical cause for these deaths, but you can also look at the social issues that underlie them. And these are what families tell us are important. So where does that leave us now? Um, it leaves me very concerned. I think these women are very invisible. Um, that leaves me concerned not only as a suicide researcher, but as a woman myself. Um, and it also makes me think that if we only look at mental ill health, it's not going to be helpful. So although we need to look at these things, we will find what we find in many, many suicide studies, which is that mental illness is linked to suicide. But it doesn't necessarily help us provide services that are going to address these issues. So in terms of recommendations, I think we need to look innovatively. I'm particularly worried about the number of suicide attempts among these women, and we have a paper that we have previously published on that, and about the service use, and I would problematize that. They are seeking help, but for some reason it's just not helping. And I think as we look again at Protect Life, we need to really ensure that we protect the lives of men and women. Thank you.